student choice this week was to look at unmanned airborne systems and how they fit into the whole remote sensing picture. So first of all, I wanted to define exactly what we're talking about when we look at unmanned airborne systems. So you might also have heard the term unmanned airborne vehicle, remotely piloted vehicle, or even drone. And these terms actually refer primarily just to the platform that the full system is associated with. So if you have a look at the diagram that I've got up there, you can see that we have an indicator platform here, in this case a quadcopter. We have some crew associated with the system because although it's called an unmanned airborne system, we still actually need crew associated with it. This just means that the platform itself is not manned, but we need crew on the ground to be able to actually pilot it. We also have payloads, so this may be various types of sensors, might be optical sensors, multispectral, hyperspectral, thermal, GPS for navigation, and also inertial measurement units, which allow us to track the roll, pitch, and yaw or movement of the platform itself. We have control stations down on the ground, so this could be done quite simply through a radio frequency or it might be getting done through Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Perhaps you have an iPad that you're controlling the system through or it might be a computer base as well. You have users who are going to obviously take the data once you've, once you've produced it or, or even your information product and they're also going to drive the reasons behind why you're actually capturing the data in the first place. Key to the full system is having significantly high-end processing software and hardware. So this is going to allow us to take the large volumes of data and process them in an effective manner. And of course we need communications between the platform and the control stations as well. So where do unmanned airborne systems actually fit within the scheme of remote sensing and what's their actual niche? why do we use them as opposed to any of the other remote sensing options that we have. So if you have a look at this figure we've got a little guy on the ground and he's looking up at the trees and the key difference between the person on the ground and any of the remote sensing platforms that you see above that is that they have a completely different perspective. So the guy on the ground is really looking up at the trees and underneath the canopy whereas the other options of either the, the UAS, the, the manned airborne system or the satellite are looking directly down on the, on the canopy. So this perspective is quite different. Now there's also a scale difference. So as an example, the satellite there is looking at a 30 meter pixel size. So it, it's a much, much larger pixel size but does cover a large area. An airborne system might give you, say, a metre to two metre spatial resolution if you're looking at multispectral or hyperspectral, or you might be lucky to get a low altitude airborne system that would give you a pixel size smaller than that. The UAS, however, we're really looking at fitting that resolution in quite close to what our own eyes are able to see. So it's giving us a spatial resolution similar to that person on the ground, but just with that perspective that's different. So it really enables us to bridge the gap between the person on the ground and those higher altitude remote sensing options. It does cover relatively small areas though, so it's really just a tool that we use in support of field data acquisition as opposed to getting used for mapping large areas. So this is an example of an image that was taken by a fixed wing UAS. This is a system held by Eris up here in the Northern Territory. And what you can see here is there's a large amount of detail in the, in the vegetation and you can start to see individual tree crowns and aspects of the vegetation itself like branches, trunks, etc. Now this image is also a really good example of some of the geometric and radiometric distortions that we have in airborne data, particularly with really low altitude stuff. So one of the things that you can see is features towards the outer part of this image have, have been geometrically displaced. So anything that's in the middle you can see directly over the top of that feature whilst features towards the edges of the scene actually appear to be pushed outwards. And this is what we call radial displacement. 
So for example, you see some of these trees, you're no longer just looking directly over the top of the tree, but you're seeing the branch, so seeing the trunks and branches associated with it as well. So it looks somewhat like those trees are lying down on the ground. So we need to be able to correct for that in order to make an orthorectified image and an accurate map. Radiometrically, you can also see an issue with this image in that the center of this image has, has a hot spot, so it's a lot brighter than what you see out towards the edges. And this also has a radial type pattern where the edges are darker. And so this is also a, a correction that we need to make post acquisition to correct for the radiometry of that image. In terms of the number of different platforms that can be used for unmanned flight, this is really looking at different types of rotary systems, so it could be a helicopter or a multi-rotor system, but you can also have fixed wing examples as well. And the two examples down the bottom of the Global Hawk and the Akana are the NASA systems, and these are both unmanned, although they are massive platforms. The ones up the top are two platforms owned by the University of Technology in Sydney, and they're much more the size that are going to support small area field work. The ones down the bottom are really for operational and large, large area mapping, target detection, and in the case of the, the bottom right, the Akana, that was really developed for looking at wildfire monitoring. So when we look at platforms and their ability to hold sensors or different payloads, this also depends on the type of platform that you have and its particular size or weight as well. So if you look at the graph that I've just popped up here in the upper left, you've got the weight of the platform on the x-axis along here with increasing weight as we go along and the weight of the associated payload that it can carry on the y-axis. So basically what you can tell from here is that the smaller systems, and so the handheld type options, are really going to only be able to carry very small payloads. So in general, the, the rotary systems can carry, for their size, they can carry a larger amount than fixed wings, but they have the issue of um, of having very short flight times. So if you look now at the endurance or the length of the length of flight that a system can can endure, we have again the weight along the x-axis and the length of time that it will fly here. So here's our, our rotary systems which are generally the ones that are held by a lot of universities and used for research and they're also great because they can hover over over set areas, which is really important to re for reducing image blur as the as the system is flying along. So they're generally our, our cheaper options as well. Fixed wings do have the longer duration, so they can they can fly much further, but they have to fly at a set speed, and they also require a larger area for takeoff and landing. Whereas a multi rotor can just be put up from where you're standing. So there's a couple of differences between the different types of platforms and then their associated usage as well. But in general, there's a, there's a number of areas where unmanned airborne systems really provide a niche capability to support both field work and image data acquisition. So they actually sort of blur the line there between the field survey and the commonly known remote sensing. But really they provide a very high spatial detail nadir perspective. So that's getting into the high spatial detail that we can see from the ground, but with that overhead perspective that makes it a lot easier for us to scale models up to high altitude airborne and satellite platforms as well. So they're really bridging the gap between the field and satellite observations. So most of the systems are very small and portable, with the exception of those large ones that I showed, like Global Hawk and the Akana. But usually the systems used for research are the very small portable hand-launched type systems. They give us an accessibility to dangerous locations or areas that are otherwise quite difficult to get to. So it's, it's remote sensing in that we can, we can get to those areas that we can't necessarily get to in the field. 
And that is also a really important occupational health and safety issue. So particularly if you're working in areas where maybe there's crocodiles, for example, that you can just allow your system to go up and do to extend your field survey for you in those locations. They do provide a degree of temporal flexibility for time sensitive monitoring. So this means that we're not really restricted to the satellite overpass timings, which are generally in the morning. And for example, if you're interested in, in some sort of marine habitat that you can only see at certain tide levels, for example, then you may find that a satellite overpass will never actually coincide with the optimal tidal time that you're interested in. So that's where the, the UAS really brings in a level of flexibility in that you can fly at whatever time of whatever time of day you like. And so that can be that can be used to supplement your field data there. So it that also allows for rapid deployment and that means that if there is an event that occurs, so potentially this could be used in, event, in, in the event of natural hazards or disasters, you have the option to just put the UAS up without actually commissioning either a satellite overpass or an airborne, other manned airborne system as well. So this actually makes them a cost effective option for mapping and monitoring, although relatively small areas. You can still put different imaging configurations onto these platforms. So it does allow you to change out options for hyperspectral, multispectral and thermal data and thermal imaging systems. But there is always a restriction with the with the payload that they can actually hold. And one of the other things that it, that's great about a UAS is that even on a cloudy day, which would still affect quite a lot of manned aircraft, the UAS is flying below the level of most clouds. So we currently have a restriction of a flight of 400 feet. So we're often, we're generally flying much, much lower than that anyway, so that we're getting that high spatial detail that we still want from the UAS. So just on the right hand side, there's a couple of pictures there provided courtesy of Vince Ambrosia at NASA. And this is an indication of how their UAS is getting was getting used for mapping and monitoring wildfire in Southern California. And up the top you can see this is a mission control center where the data is directly downlinked from the UAS and it's just pumped directly into Google Earth. So the bottom there you can also see what the image looks like. You've got an overlay of multispectral imagery and you can also see in some parts these yellow fire fronts which was obtained by using thermal data as well. So the the commanders on the ground who are actually deciding where to where to place their efforts in in attacking that fire are actually getting this really valuable information and in real time as it's occurring. So it really helps them with understanding the the environment in which the fire is unfolding and then gives them that additional information to be able to manage it.